Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. And that is, we're going to go to verse 18. Matthew 5, 18. In Matthew 5, verse 18, it says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. I want you to take a moment and imagine a scenario. Someone, a reporter from Forbes magazine, calls you and tells you, that they want a, to publish a story about you. Now they do want you to keep it between maybe 300 to 500 words. Now you know that Forbes magazine is a very important business magazine. It's looked at by many uh, rich people, many uh, uh, high officials and such. It's a very, it's a very big magazine. And it's going to be published on the, on the internet as well. It's going to be published on all these magazines. So it's your story. 300 to 500 words. What are you going to say? Without a doubt, you would make sure that you choose your words correctly. You wouldn't want to choose words that would give the wrong idea. You wouldn't want your words to seem inconsistently used either. You would make sure to have as much clarity as possible so that the reader knows who you are. You wouldn't want others to add to your story either because it's your story. You wouldn't want any kind of mistakes to be made in that story either. You would want everything in that story to be absolutely true. Now, if you take that concept, and apply it to the greatest being in the universe and the book that he authored, this is what you get. God wants us to take everything he has said for face value. The Bible never mentions something without it needing to be said. Many things throughout the Bible uh, is there and it's been recorded perfectly. Perhaps you think, oh, maybe there's mistakes in the Bible. Yeah, there's mistakes. But the human mistakes have been perfectly recorded. Let me get that clear. If somebody has lied, that was recorded. If somebody murdered, that was recorded. If somebody committed adultery, that was recorded. Everything humanly mistaken was recorded. But everything God wanted is there written 100%. Now, according to 2 Timothy 3.16, we know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's profitable in four different areas, in fact. And even just as we read in our verse, Jesus said, For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Why am I saying all this? The biggest thing is for today's message is I want to take a look at something I hold very dearly to, and that is history and geography. Perhaps you've experienced this sometime in your life. You go out somewhere, you're on vacation, and you're talking to someone, and you get to know them and such, and then you tell them, oh yeah, I'm from Vancouver. You say Vancouver because who's going to find Surrey anyways, right? So you say Vancouver because that's the biggest city you live close to. And then you tell them you're from Canada too. And then that person goes ahead and asks you, well, do you know this such and such a person? who lives in Toronto. And then you're going, well, you do realize that Toronto and Vancouver 
is about the width of all of Europe without Russia. You know, putting it into perspective. See, the thing is, geography is something that's easily forgotten, easily put aside when you're reading your Bible. You know, you see it, you see the word Nazareth, you see the word Gali uh, Galilee, you see these, these cities, these names of cities, and they don't mean much to you because, well, you didn't grow up there. This, these places are nearly 2,000 years old, more than 2,000 years old, and you don't give too much thought about it. But believe it or not, God did mention them, and they are there in your Bible for a specific reason. Now, I want to bring you this in a two-part series. I don't want to make it into, into some kind of college lecture or anything like that. But God's word is rich. God's word is filled with many things, many places that he wants you to see. And when you take account of what is Bible geography or the geography that's inside the Bible, it will amaze you how much more rich your Bible study will become. Now, by no means, I'm no expert. I just like history. I just like geography. And I'm going to try as best as I can not to turn this into some kind of college lecture so that you can enjoy it at the same time. And uh, I know that this is a whole broadcast, so feel free to pause if you ever feel like it. You can always catch up, and this will be, re uh, this will be placed again in the uh, church website later. So, before further ado, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would uh, speak through to hearts. Even in, with these little facts, these little places that we'll be looking at, I pray, Father, that uh, it would just enrich our Bible study and enrich our Christian lives as we read your word and draw closer to you. Help us, Lord, to take your word for face value. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just uh, speak to somebody's heart today. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, when you look at a map, perhaps the fastest way, I'm talking about a world map, perhaps the fastest way to find Israel is to first find the Mediterranean Sea. Now, I'm putting up a Mediterranean uh, Sea map so you could see it. The fastest way to find it is Israel is on the east side of the Mediterranean. As soon as you find the Mediterranean, look to the east, you'll find Israel. It's that easy. Now, something very interesting about uh, the word Mediterranean, I just found this interesting because uh, I'm into a certain series. In Latin, the word Mediterranean actually means Middle Earth. Middle Earth or middle land. We call it Mediterranean today, but the Bible translators, they didn't call it that way back then. It is a Latin word after all. There are all kinds of theories to why uh, they didn't, but the Mediterranean Sea is actually mentioned a few times in your Bible, especially in the Old Testament. If you look in Exodus 23, 31, it's called the Sea of the Philistines because the Philistines were the ones that mainly inhabited that area, or at least that coastline. Numbers 13.29, it's called the sea. And Deuteronomy 11.24, it's called the uttermost sea. In Joshua 1.4, it's called the great sea. So Israel is also the land that Abraham was told to go to, right? It was called Canaan land. And God had called him out of the Ur of the Chaldees. And I'm going to put up another picture here showing you the Fertile Crescent. And within the Fertile Crescent, you can see the route that Abraham took. And notice how his journey literally followed the Fertile Crescent. Now, the Fertile Crescent today, it uh, you can mostly see it in modern-day Turkey, modern-day um, Iraq and such. And uh, it was constituted by these two rivers. The two rivers that passed through it were the Euphrates and Tigris. They were, uh, they were originating from somewhere that was called the Taurus Mountains. The Taurus Mountains were the ones all the way at the top. 
Okay, Taurus Mountains were in Turkey. So these rivers would come through. Now, fun fact about Taurus, the word Taurus means bull. Right? And as you may know, the Canaanites loved their bulls. They worshipped them. Not only the Canaanites, the Egyptians worshipped them too. Right? So, maybe that, that could be why these mountains were called the Taurus Mountains, because they were always the ones, uh, those mountains were the ones providing the water for these rivers. But the Tigris is mentioned twice in your Bibles. Once in Genesis 2, and the other one is in Daniel 10.4. And it's also, it also goes by the name of Hiddekel. Hiddekel is the Tigris River. Now, the other, word, the other river, Euphrates, is mentioned way more than the Tigris. Uh, you've probably seen it many times through the Bible, and we've seen it come up even in Revelation a few times. We're going to see it come up again soon, if you're following the, the series in Revelations with Pastor White. But it's also the land that God had promised for Abraham. It was measured with the, with the Euphrates River. Okay? God used it to show Abraham how far he will give the land to his seed. This river was also fought after by the Assyrians, by the kings of Israel, by Babylon, by, Assyria, uh, by Egypt, excuse me. And it's mentioned again in Revelation, as I had said. So these rivers are significant because in the, uh, they were the two sources of water for the whole empire of Babylon. And as you may know, God actually ends up drying it up in Revelation 16 before Babylon falls, right? So it's a significant thing because it's a part of the downfall of Babylon. He dries up the Euphrates River. Now, that area, that fertile crescent, as we know it, may also be known uh, or may be uh, more familiar to you as the Mesopotamia. That's also where, what we call Mesopotamia. In the Bible, it's called Shinar or Shinar. Shinar, if you remember in Genesis 10, Genesis 10, that's actually where Babel was first constructed, right? And from Babel, you have the many other cultures, the many other cultures coming out of many other languages, right? Those languages splitting apart because of the confusion of language. When God called Abraham, it was from that area, not Babel specifically, but Ur of the Chaldees. You can see it there, even on the map. Ur was very close to Babylon. So it was in that area. Now I'm going to read through Genesis 11.31 and watch how Abraham's route works. Okay, so if you even want to follow through while you're looking at that map there, in Genesis 11 verse 31, I'm just going to read it through. And you could follow along in the map and see Abraham's voyage come to life in a sense. Okay, so starting in Genesis 11, verse 31, going all the way to Genesis 12, verse 5. It says, And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of the country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took 
Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. So if you were following along there, you can see how they went from Ur, then they went to Haran, and then from Haran they went to Canaan, right? So now we fast forward just a little bit for geography's sake, and what we have is the land of Israel, right? Within Israel, they had a few enemies. They were surrounded, and the land that surrounded them were owned by these uh, four, I'm going to say four, that mainly Edom, Ammon, Moab, and then the Philistines. Those were their immediate um, enemies most of the time. You see them, main, those are the main enemies that they had to deal with in Joshua, that they had to deal with when it comes to the book of Judges. So, as we know, the story of Ammon and Moab, how did they come? Ammon and Moab, they were the sons of, or I, I should say grandsons of Lot. And you know that Ammon and Moab, uh, they were the products of an incestuous relationship that Lot had with his daughters. So Ammon and Moab, they, they were some of the first enemies that Israel ever had. You can see their story in Genesis 19, verse 36 to 38. And Edom, we know, is actually just the name of Esau. The, he was the brother of Jacob. He was the brother of Israel. So his story is found in Genesis 25, verse 30, all the way to Genesis 36, verse 1. And the Philistines, they, hold, they held what we would say is the modern-day Gaza Strip. Their main cities were Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, and Gath. Now, Gath is famous for their NBA players. I'm just kidding. They had giants, and some of the more important giants or the more famous giants that came out of there was Goliath and his brothers. So they were from Gath. So whenever you see those names, you know, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Gaza, Ekron, uh, Gath, read the story of Samson. You'll see those cities coming up because those were Philistine cities. Okay. Now going back to Abraham, Abraham could have stopped in Canaan, right? If you look back here in that map, you can see that he could have stopped in Canaan. But as we know, he didn't. There was a famine in the land, so he went down all the way to Egypt, right? He went down all the way to Egypt. It was, uh, look here in uh, chapter 12, verse 10. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. Now, <clears throat> going back to Abram, he could have stopped at Canaan. But he had a lapse in faith. He had a, a lapse in, in obedience to God because of this famine. Abram was afraid to die. So for his wife's sake, he told, him, uh, he told her, if they ask you, if you are my wife, I need you to be in denial. They were in Egypt. Nile. Anyway, it's a very appropriate thing to say. Uh, the Nile is something that also God had used to promise to Abram the area that he was going to give. In the Bible, the Nile is actually found. And you can see the Nile come up in a few places. You can see it come up with, different, uh, with even a different name. Sihor is probably the more common one that you may see, especially if you're reading Isaiah and Jeremiah. Isaiah 23 verse 3 talks about Sihor. Jeremiah talks about Sihor, and that's the Nile River. In Genesis and in Exodus, it's called the river, especially when it's talking in context of Egypt. In Genesis 15, verse 18, it's called the river of Egypt. And that's in Abraham's case. And the thing is, even the Nile River is significant. You see it as being part of the first plague. It was the one that got turned into blood. 
that's the river that got turned into blood. It was also, pro more, most scholars think, that's probably the river that Moses was put in and that the Pharaoh's daughter had found him in. So that's significant as well. Egypt plays a big role in geography but, and, and throughout the Bible also. Going back here to Canaan land, I want to show you something. There were two highways that came out of Egypt. The Israelites had to leave Egypt at some point, especially in Exodus. Right? So there were two ways that they could have come out of. There was the way of the sea that's coming through the coastal area of the east of, uh, sorry, the west of Israel. And then there's the eastern part of Israel that they could have come up. That's called the King's Highway. And we know that about the King's Highway because of uh, the people that they had to deal with, the Edomites. They had to deal with the Edomites many times throughout the book of Numbers, right? So as you read through your Bible, you can see that there, there's these two areas, there's these two ways that the Israelites had to come out of Egypt. And by the time they had come out of Egypt, you see it in the book of Joshua and you see it in the book of Judges and such. You'll see this expression come up from Dan to Beersheba. From Dan to Beersheba. And usually that expression is to show the extent of the territory that Israel had had. You can see there, there's the tribes in different colors in that map. There's the different tribes. And that, uh, that expression is mentioned many times over, especially in Judges 20, verse 1, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. As you may know, Israel was actually supposed to have much more territory than just that. In fact, if you go back here to Genesis 15, verse 18, you can see that God had promised Abraham much more land than what Israel had ended up taking. In verse 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 18, it says, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now we just talked about the river of Egypt, which is the Nile River. And then we talked about Euphrates. That was actually the home, where the hometown of Abram was in Ur. You can see that that area is actually gigantic. In between, it's about 1,500 miles. Okay? And I am putting up that picture here. That square that I'm showing you, that's the area that Abram or Abraham's seed was supposed to get, that Israel was supposed to get. But look at the area they ended up with. You see, there is, there is something to be said here about what the Israelites did. And also it pictures a little bit of what Christians end up doing also. Israel was promised so much. They could have had so much but they missed out because of a lack of faith, because of a lack of obedience. See, you even know it, the Israelites could have come out of the wilderness sooner than they had if they had faith. If they knew that God had promised, they could have gone into the, into the promised land sooner than what they ended up, uh, how they ended up 40 years later. But they didn't. You know, the Bible says that, it requ uh, that what is required in our lives, if we are just, if we are justified as Christians, we ought to live by faith. Taking apart that word, Christ even says that even if you had a little faith, as small as a grain of a mustard seed, you could move mountains. But what does that mean? I thought... Faith was the substance of things hoped for. And now you're telling me that it can be the size of a mustard seed. See, here is where it comes in. When you're going through a time, 
through good times especially. You know, the mountaintop experiences especially. As a Christian, as a good Christian, you'd go to church. You'd read your Bible probably. You'd pray. You have no problem with tithing. You have no problem going to church and, show, you know, coming, coming in on time and such. And you have no, no problem doing, doing things that, are, that you know are needed in the Christian life. But now what about in the valleys? It's not as easy to tithe. You know, when, you, uh, when your car breaks down and all of a sudden you have this giant expense, is it as easy to tithe? Or is it as easy to give an offering? When a pandemic hits, it's not as easy to show up to church, is it? But what about showing up online or encouraging others to show up online? It's not as easy. But the, here's the question. Will you, still thought, will you still tithe? Will you still keep praying? Will you still keep reading your Bible? Even during these valley low times, will you keep doing these things? See, mountaintop experiences show that we are able to do the things that God would want us to do when everything is going easy for us. But these valley-type experiences really show where our heart was. Faith is when you obey God even during those hard times. You would do what God has asked to do even when your life is not going the way you would like it to go. The Israelites could have gotten into the promised land sooner. But because of their lack of faith, they had to wait a whole generation before they can finally enter into their promised land. The Israelites could have had so many more blessings, but they didn't run the Canaanites out. In fact, they dwelt with them. God would even have helped them to drive them out, but they didn't. See, another thing you will notice with the Israelites, and somebody has once said this, my fridge is full of things, but there's nothing to eat. Someone was once lazy, and somebody was once uh, lazy to pull out something to eat. A lot of times we miss out on the blessings just because we don't want to reach in and take them. There was a story once told of a faithful Christian who was tired and he'd passed away. And then he came to the gates of heaven and he was greeted by an angel. And the angel began to tour him through the streets of heaven. At some point, they came across this house that wasn't really decorated or anything like that. It wasn't very fancy. It just had a door. And the man pleaded with the angel to take a look inside of the house. Despite the angel's warnings, uh, he, he went in. Uh, what he saw were tons and tons and tons of boxes. Uh, boxes put in shelves, and these shelves were going up and up and up and up and up. And they were filled. These boxes were filled. They were heavy. Every box he looked at had his name on it. Now he asked if he could open them. And the angel, he was suggesting not to. But despite the warning, the man still opened it. And what he saw were blessings, gifts, promises from God that he wanted, that God wanted to give him. He asked the angel, why are these blessings, why are these gifts, why are these promises still in boxes? And the angel replied, because you simply didn't open them. God wanted to give them to you. All you had to do was ask for them whenever you came across them in his word. When God presents to you a moment where you could serve him, why don't you take it? When God presents to you a time where you could get alone with him, why don't you take it? When God presents to you a time where you can give, 
why don't you give and take that opportunity? When God presents to you a time to do something for him, why not obey and do it? Faith is shown when we know what God wants us to do, and it's found in his word, and then we do it. That's obedience. When we take God at face value, when we see something in God's word, and we know that it's what he wants us to do, then do it. At the beginning of this message, I started off with saying how much God's words mean something. They're not there for, as an accident. They're not there as a mistake. They're there for a reason, and they're there for you. So you could use them. Let's never take it for granted. I know I I was talking about geography, and this is a a two-part series that I want to do. But let's keep trusting in God. Let's show ourselves faithful, even in the mountaintops and the valleys. Keep doing what God told you to do by faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this message, and I pray, Lord, that it would speak to somebody's heart, that you would allow us to be faithful, filled with faith, and that you would allow us to take every opportunity you give us, especially if we find something in your word, Lord, that we would put it to action, knowing the things that you give us and how much more we are held accountable for it. We pray, Father, that every time we come across something in your word, that we would put it into action, that uh, if it can be applied to us, that we would put it into action. Pray, Lord, that it would be used, that uh, this geography would even be used by you, Lord, uh, for your honor and your glory, even in the lives of your people. And also, Lord, that you would bless them as they give uh, during this Wednesday service. I pray, Lord. And thank you for all that you do. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, everyone, I ask, uh, as we're about to close the message, and we're about to enter our offering time, that uh, you would give. You could see at the bottom, if you're on our church website, at the bottom of our video, you could see it there. It says, Donate Now or Give Now. Or you could see it at uh, at the top right of your screen. It says to donate. You could also go to gracebaptistchurch.ca slash donate to give. And during the offertory time, you'll even see a phone number. There's really no excuse not to give. But I ask that you'd stay faithful to what you'd pledged even to give to your missionaries and to God himself, even if it's your tithe. So let's head now to the donate page and give. Thank you.